our next guest thinks he might have the key to reviving the American dream. Raj Shetty is a Harvard University professor. He's using big data to understand how to give kids from disadvantaged backgrounds better chances of succeeding. From his own personal experience of moving to the U.S. at the age of nine, he's made it his mission to think about how to give other kids the same opportunities that he had. Our Hari Srinivasan sat down with him to understand just how that might work. And this conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America. It's called Chasing the Dream. So your work for several years has chronicled what I would say how the Horatio Alger story about you know pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, working hard, that that notion of the American dream is simply not true, at least by the data that you've looked at. Why is the American dream, as we've all been led to believe it. Why is that fading? Yeah, so to start with the facts, back in the 1940s and 1950s, virtually all kids in America would grow up to have a higher standard of living than their parents did. So for children born in 1940, for example, 90% of them went on to have a higher standard of living than their parents. And if you look at kids who were born in the 1980s who are turning 30 today when we're measuring their incomes, that number is down to 50%. It's a 50-50 shot as to whether you're going to achieve the American dream of moving up. Mm -hmm. And so that fading of the American dream, you know, I think is of tremendous concern from an economic perspective, socially, politically. And there are a variety of factors that I think play into what's driving that trend. At a macroeconomic level, a lot of it has to do with the fact that wage rates and incomes for people in the middle of the income distribution basically haven't gone up over the past 30 years. So most of the economic growth that's occurred in America uh, has gone to the very, very top of the income distribution. And you've, you've, you've kind of pointed out three kind of big categories that where you're born, what your education level is, and what race you are, are huge determinants. And we don't like to kind of think about that because, again, we've been led to believe everyone has an equal shot and everyone can get above their uh, kind of uh, status where they were born. Where they were born, I mean, down to the zip code level or the census track is enormous. That's exactly right. So it's not just about broad regional variation. It's not just about the Midwest versus the East Coast versus the Southeast. It's actually about block to block variation within cities. So in our most recent work, we've been uh, developing a tool that we call the Opportunity Atlas, which allows you to zoom in to specific blocks within cities and look at what kids' chances of rising out of poverty are at that very granular level. And the remarkable fact that you see is that in virtually every city in America, there are incredibly sharp differences in children's chances of rising out of poverty that range from uh, the types of levels we see in the countries that have the highest levels of social mobility in the world. So these are often Scandinavian countries or countries like Canada where you see kids growing up in low-income families generally have pretty good odds of rising up. But then you also have a couple of miles down the road some neighborhoods where if you look at the same kids from low-income families, same backgrounds, their chances of rising up look lower than any country for which we currently have data. So to me, that's fascinating because it's both, you know, a challenge given the, the scale of this problem, but it's also an opportunity, right? Because it means the answer in terms of restoring the American dream is not about going back to a previous era or looking at a completely different set of countries. It's often about looking two miles down the road and figuring out what's going on there and how you can replicate that. Where are you getting this data? It's not like you're out there surveying people and asking them this or that. I mean, where is this information coming from and how big is it? What's the scale? So the modern era of social science, I think, is really fueled by the availability of big data, much as we all hear about big data being used in the private sector. Our vision is that such data can be used to tackle important social and economic policy questions. And so in this particular case, a lot of the data we're working with comes from anonymized census, tax, and social security data mm -hmm. that allows us to follow very large samples of people over time. So many of the statistics that we're constructing on children's chance of rising out of poverty, they're based on 20 million kids, all kids born in the early 1980s in the United States. And it's that scope where we're able to follow 20 million children over a 30-year period would have been impossible prior to the advent of the modern information age. Mm -hmm. That's what's allowing us to drill down. 
So when it comes to neighborhoods uh, and long-term outcomes, you've been studying, for example, voucher programs that have existed for a long time. Uh, your previous research found that there wasn't a net difference if you just gave people money to move. And then you did kind of a different experiment in Seattle. Explain what you tried. So the whole idea of these affordable housing programs is that they're supposed to give families access to higher opportunity areas where they and their kids might thrive. But puzzlingly, we see that most families, something like 80% of families that receive these housing vouchers, still live in relatively high poverty, low opportunity neighborhoods. So what we did in Seattle was a pilot study where we asked, so why is it that families aren't taking those vouchers and going and finding housing in these affordable areas where we think their kids would have much better chances of escaping poverty? Is it because of preferences? So maybe you want to stay in the neighborhoods where you currently live because it's close to your family, close to your job. There might be many good reasons you might want to stay in those areas. Or is the degree of segregation that we're seeing in many of these cities driven by some sort of set of barriers where families you know, might not have assistance in the search process, they might not have the information they need. So we did a pilot where we, for a randomly selected set of families, there were about a thousand families involved in this study in Seattle, they had applied through the regular process for a housing voucher. Half of them randomly selected, we gave these additional services to help them help ease the search process, basically remove some of those barriers, identify landlords who might be willing to rent to you in high opportunity neighborhoods, uh, give you information about where those neighborhoods were, provide a little bit of assistance and saying, you know, here's a unit you could go check out and mm -hmm. so forth. And what we found is that little bit of assistance up front, which actually only increases the total program upfront cost by something like 2%, that dramatically shifts where families choose to live. So in the control group, about 15% of families live in these high opportunity neighborhoods within Seattle. In the treatment group, that jumps up to 55 or 60%. So the majority of families are now choosing to live in neighborhoods where we estimate that their kids will go on to earn an additional $200,000 over their lifetimes as a result of that simple move about five, 10 miles away from where they were living before. You're also making a distinction. You're, you're calling these high opportunity zones, not necessarily low poverty yes. zones. What constitutes a high opportunity zone? Yes, exactly, and that's very important. So what we're defining as a high opportunity zone is a place where we see in the data, kids who grow up there end up having high rates of upward mobility. So it's an outcome-based approach. It's just asking in a very direct way, if, you know, let's say you're a parent deciding where to live, Simple way to think about it is, where have I seen kids in the past who, who grew up in these neighborhoods? Where have kids gone on to do well? In terms of maybe having a high rate of attending college, high level of earnings, and so forth and so on. So it's just kind of a, where do we see good outcomes? Now that could be related to factors like having lower poverty rates, mm -hmm. factors like having better schools and so forth. But what's so powerful about these data is, we don't need to rely on proxies for what might or might not predict rates of upward mobility, we can just kind of directly measure the thing that I think matters to many of us. Where are you going to achieve the American dream? One of the th cities that you looked at, Chicago, for example, let's say there's a white kid and a black kid growing up friends and neighbors in a more distressed neighborhood, but their economic outcomes are going to be very different because of race. I mean, a lot of times in, in science studies, we see correlation. You're just saying straight up causation. This is the factor. Yeah. holding for all other things. And you can't uh, overstate the importance of race and economic mobility. So, you know, some people like to think that class is a dominant factor and maybe conditional on your income class. Mm -hmm. Race is of secondary importance. That is absolutely not true in the United States. So we have seen with data covering essentially the entire U.S. population, take a black kid and a white kid, not just in Chicago, anywhere in the U.S., growing up in the same neighborhood, families at the same income level, same wealth level, both growing up in two-parent households. Think of as many things as you can to make those two families look identical, except for the race dimension. And you see vastly different chances of upward mobility, specifically for boys. So there are big differences in rates of mobility for black boys relative to white boys, mm. much lower chances of climbing out of poverty. But for black women, your odds of rising up controlling for your parents' income are about the same as for low, white women growing up in low-income families. So mm. there's a gender by race intersectionality here where it's really about
uh, men, black men, who are facing challenges and, and rising up. So what's the biggest possible influence to give a young black boy a shot? Yeah, so you know, you might naturally think of things like uh, the criminal justice system, right? So we see incredibly high rates of incarceration for black men growing up in very low-income families. I think that's one of the tragic features of uh, the, the current state of affairs in the United States. Uh, and so, you know, that could be one aspect, thinking about how you reduce interactions with the criminal justice system. That could involve things directly, uh, you know, in the space of mass incarceration, sentencing laws, and so forth. But it could also involve things earlier on in the childhood development process, changing access to schools. Another very strong mm -hmm. predictor we find is the number of black fathers in a neighborhood is very strongly predictive of black men's outcomes. If you grow up in a neighborhood where there are more black fathers who are present, we see that black boys have significantly better outcomes. Interestingly, there's no correlation with the outcomes of black women or white women and white boys. So it's something very specific. A plausible explanation is that this is about mentors, for example. If you mm. see people following... Or somebody to model. Exactly, a role model. Uh, somebody whose career pathway you can follow of your gender, someone who you know looks like you, you, you can kind of follow in their footsteps. That makes well, a big difference. And that sort of pivots back to the other part about race, right? If you're in a neighborhood and there is a criminal justice system that has incarcerated a large population of older black men that you might be able to look up to, there you are having a lower outcome and then the cycle sort of perpetuates That's exactly itself, right. right. That's exactly right. I think these things, uh, there are lots of feedback loops here yeah. where you, know, you intervene in one part of the system, it might in the next generation have, can create sort of a virtuous cycle or, or a vicious cycle. So you know, education has always been uh, one of those ways that people say, okay, this is going to be the opportunity. If I can get myself to college, uh, I've, I'm going to make it out of this particular station in life, and I'm going to have this. And, and you have looked at access to schools, outcomes from schools, the mobility rates within schools. Um, what do the numbers show? Is college the way out of where you are? Yeah. So I think there's truth in that as an aspiration. Unfortunately, as a reality, colleges are as segregated in America as neighborhoods are. So in other words, if I'm a kid from a high-income family, yeah. my odds of meeting a kid from a lower-income family in my childhood neighborhood are just about the same as my odds of meeting a kid from a lower-income family in the college to which I attend, the college that I attend. So the colleges that kids from high-income families attend are very different from the colleges that kids from poorer families attend. And importantly, the colleges that kids from higher-income families attend, as you might expect intuitively, they tend to be the more selective ones, you know, the elite private colleges, yeah. often the flagship state public institutions like the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, or UC Berkeley. And those are institutions where we see terrific outcomes for children, the kids who graduate from there go on, perhaps not surprisingly, to have high levels of earnings and so forth. Mm. But there are very, very few low-income kids at places like Harvard, Yale, Princeton. There's a, a recent story headline that uh, I just remember reading the other day. It said 43% of white students that Harvard admits are legacies, jocks, or the kids of donors and faculty. And look, I mean, I'm, I'm a Harvard professor, right? So, I mean, I recognize that there are trade-offs that institutions like Harvard make in order to support research, in order to support many different missions. Right. But I think at some point we are, as an institution at Harvard and more broadly in the United States in higher education, going to have to confront in a, in a very direct way what our ultimate mission is. And if it's to contribute to social mobility, which I think many of us mm -hmm. view as a central goal, I think one needs to at least think seriously about the trade-offs in the types of policies that you just described. You know, speaking of policies right now, on the, at least on the Democratic campaign trail, we hear a lot about different variations of wiping out student debt or trying to figure out how to solve for, like, uh, like Andrew Yang has a an universal yeah. basic income yeah. plan. Will those sorts of policies, let's say best case scenario, somebody, whoever's president, gets their hands on the economic levers and is yeah. able to pull some of these switches? Would they have an impact? So let's take each of those in turn. So something, I find some of these policy instruments are a bit blunt. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about free college, for example, so that sounds good and I think potentially moves in the right direction. But as in many other settings, we find that there's tremendous variation across colleges 
in terms of their impacts on kid outcomes. And so I think a solution like we just need to make all colleges free is a bit too gruff. We need to provide greater access to the institutions that are really propelling kids upward, and we need to figure out how you improve outcomes in the institutions that aren't doing as well. And I think that message goes not just for institutions of higher education, but all of the various um, you know, pillars of our society that try to create upward mobility, from the K through 12 elementary school to various other programs that we have, from housing vouchers like we talked about, uh, to welfare programs, designing them in ways such that we're actually supporting the specific programs that create upward mobility rather than a broad brush thing. I know you haven't sort of taken, uh, you haven't worked for a campaign, you haven't worked for an administration. That's ob obviously an active choice. I'm sure mm -hmm. people come to you and say, hey, listen, can you be my economic policy advisor? Can you do X or Y? Um, what are you hoping kind of in the next five years, 10 years? I mean, this is just kind of the data set that you've had access to, and these are the things that you've start, been started to tease out of it. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, what other lines of inquiry are you mm -hmm. intrigued by now? Well. What I want to use these data for is to define, in a scientific way, answers to the question of how we can increase equality of opportunity in America. So what I like about studying that issue is that I think it's, even in this very politically partisan time, one that people from both sides of the aisle can embrace. I think everyone in America believes in equality of opportunity, no matter your background, no matter where you came from, at least as an abstract ideal to, to aim for, right? So, you know, part of the reason I myself don't get directly involved in partisan politics is I want to take an apolitical scientific stance to answering these questions. Uh, <clears throat> and I think we can identify things like better ways to design our affordable housing programs, better ways to design our school systems, ways to finance higher education that will lead to higher levels of upward mobility. I think we can systematically go down the list and kind of understand the recipe for high rates of upward mobility in certain parts of the country, certain neighborhoods, and replicate that throughout the United States. In a way, you're talking about sort of desegregating the ways that we have broken up by geography, by education, by race. It's, I mean, it's, it's, a, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a big, uh, big thing to tackle. It's absolutely a big thing to tackle, but I think a lot of these things, you know, this comes back to the feedback loops that we talked about where they can build on each other. So in one generation, if you figure out how to help some kids rise up, that might reduce the amount of segregation in the next generation, which itself then leads to better opportunities for kids from lower income families. The one place where I would hesitate on that conclusion is coming back to race. Mm. And so one aspect that we have not talked about yet, but I think is very important in the context of race, is that even if you look at kids from the most affluent families, my expectation when we were doing this research was that at some point race would become unimportant. If you were from the richest families in America, maybe race would start to play a secondary mm. role if you went to the best schools, grew up in the best neighborhoods, and so forth. And a really disappointing finding in the data for me was that that's totally false. Even if you grow up in a family at the top 1% of the income distribution, you go to the best schools in the city of New York, you go to the, uh, you know, you're living in the best neighborhoods, you're growing up in a two-parent family with quite a bit of wealth. You still see that black boys who grow up in those families have much higher chances of falling down the income ladder than white boys do. So white boys who grow up in affluent families tend to remain at the top of the income distribution in the next generation. Mm. But black men, unfortunately, end up, due to various structural forces, falling back down to the middle class or even the bottom of the income distribution. That, I think, is quite distressing because, you know, often we focus on how can we help kids from disadvantaged neighborhoods rise up. But if we've got this constant treadmill downward pressure, we're never going to actually narrow black-white disparities in the United States unless we address the problems of the black middle class and the upper middle class and figure out how we can help them stay there. This is one where I think we need to think hard about how we fix that treadmill. Raj Shetty, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Harry.